Hi folks, this is uh, Wartech again. Um, I just wanted to talk about heat treating a little bit. I know the video is a little dark, but um, he, this is basically the furnace that I used to heat treat. And I think what it was was an old uh, furnace that was used probably in a dentist's office. But when I got it, if you look there, it says one. That's actually one uh, degree Celsius. Um, it, the problem with it, what, I purchased it, it didn't have a working thermometer and the controls were kind of messed up. So what I did is I bought it cheap on eBay and replaced some of the components. And so one of the components is this uh, uh, controller right here and they're not too expensive. Um, the way you work this is um, you simply uh, buy yourself a controller a thing called a uh, solid state relay and that just turns it on and off. If you see there's a little green light that's flashing. This thing's programmed to, to raise its temperature up to uh, 25 degrees uh, centigrade and so it's actually pulsing uh, the power on and off to make the, the uh, furnace work and so you have three components for this. A controller, a solid state relay, that's a switch that goes on and off, and a thermocouple and so inside this, and it might be a little difficult to see, in the back there is a, a thermocouple and it, it's really impossible to see, but it's basically um, a thermometer for it. And so, let's pull back here a little bit, but the dimensions of this furnace aren't that big. I've got a little sh uh, shelf system I can pull out and put pieces in diagonally, but um, this is about it. And so you can purchase these furnaces for not too much money if they're broken and then fix them yourself. And uh, I can certainly answer any questions about um, how to how to do that in more detail uh, online. But um, this is how I heat treat. And so um, I've got at least an example or a few examples here of a rock that I've treated. And let's see if we can get a better view. Um, this is uh, not a very high quality chunk of uh, flint from Texas and uh, just a spall. And it's hard to kind of see, but I, I knocked off a flake right here and it's a little shinier. And this is a little duller on this side. Um, the reason for that is because when you heat treat um, cryptocrystalline rock, what you're actually doing is removing water from it. And that might sound a little strange, but cryptocrystalline rock is really just very, very tiny crystals of quartz that are fused together as an aggregate. And so when you remove water, it puts the whole piece under a little bit of tension and it literally forms more bonds, chemical bonds to each other. And so when you hit it, there's a more effective use of force. It runs, you know, each grain is connected to another grain in a, in a stronger manner. And so when you hit it, the, the flakes tend to travel farther. But the interesting thing is when you look at the material, and it is, you can see it's a little shinier here. The reason for that is, and it's duller on this side because this is before I baked it, is because if you look under an electron microscope, what you find out is that the individual grains on this side, uh, more often than not, or, or more often what happens is the flake that runs through it, the scar or the, um, the break goes right through the crystal. And so it makes a flat uh, surface that reflects light better. Um, on this side, what happens is sometimes as it's the flake is running across, it'll go around a crystal. And that produces basically like a little jagged peak that reflects light in different directions, and so it appears duller. Another interesting thing about some of these rocks is that, especially for the darker colored ones, if you have like a, a black flint, oftentimes you'll find um, fool's gold in it. Little tiny crystals of fool's gold. And I gotta be honest, I was looking at um, one of the pieces earlier on when I started this hobby and I thought, oh my gosh, gold! Well, I was the fool and it was really fool's gold. And so, um, what happens is, as this is, as water is leaving this rock, um, it interacts with that uh, iron disulfide, fool's gold, and it produces hydrogen sulfide. So one of the interesting effects that you don't get on film is it smells. So it's hydrogen sulfide that's being produced and that provides kind of an interesting, and I haven't seen this in the literature anywhere, um, scientific literature that is, where anybody really talks about heat treating and the production of volatile gases. Now, if this, if a rock was treated, you know, 70,000 years ago, would you expect to uh, see any hydrogen sulfide left in it? Well, that's hard to say. Um, and in terms of a, a uh, 
analysis, it would be somewhat destructive, and I, I suspect any artifacts you wouldn't want to um, uh, put them through too destructive a, an analysis. But it would be kind of interesting to see if any volatile gases come off of uh, an artifact that people suspect of being heat treated. Um, but anyway, if you don't heat treat it, I've uh, percussion rock that's uh, clearly got fool's gold in it. You don't smell anything. It's only when you heat treat it. And so um, in heat treating, uh, you know, a lot of folks have cheaper ways of doing this. They use, uh, um, you know, uh, turkey roaster uh, setups and things like that. And that's fine. But, you know, it's higher temperature is usually what's necessary to get some of these uh, flints to work right. And so I actually have, let's see, here a little chart. Yeah, that's pretty hard to see. With oh just my notes on the temperature conversion because the guys want to know what it is in fahrenheit you know um and then just some general ideas in terms of you know where to bake these things at and uh it's funny novaculite is actually really kind of an interesting outlier because you have to heat it so much higher but um you know the thing is with this system if you have a controller you don't need to worry about baking it too fast because you can program the thing to ramp by itself over the course of a few days and the temperature ramp is slow enough that you tend not to have pot letting where you get too much water pressure and steam build up and have the uh, rock explode essentially and it you know it, I've I've heard these things uh, go off and it sounds like kind of like a popcorn machine going and that's usually because I just went too high a temperature so sometimes there's a trial and error uh, component to you know figuring out what the heat treat's going to be but um, that's about it. I mean, you know, cryptocrystalline rocks uh, sometimes are helped a lot by heat treating. Um, I've never really seen much improvement with obsidian. I know people talk about it, but for the most part, cherts, flints, uh, jaspers, cryptocrystalline rocks in general, I seem to have uh, some luck with, uh, you know, some heat treat improvement. Doesn't always work, especially if the material is very grainy. Um, you've never had any success with quartzite, so, um, but as a technique, it, it, it's useful in allowing you to, uh, you know, get more out of the material that you've got, and uh, if you have a source of uh, um, flint or chert that isn't particularly workable, uh, at least to you, heat treating it can actually be a, a, a nice way of just opening up some material that otherwise you wouldn't be able to work, so um, that's about it. Um, uh, you know, heat treating is, uh, is a, it's just a nice way of making uh, materials that otherwise wouldn't be very good uh, a little better for you. So, that's it. Thanks. Bye.